Welcome back. We are continuing our study of the homilies of Clement. And we're, so we're up to homily number six. Uh, we're getting ready to start it. Uh, basically, the last couple, of, the last homily, what happened was um, Clement had ran into his friend Apion, who uh, challenged him to a debate. Um, Clement started off the debate, uh, and then whenever he got finished presenting his side, it was getting late, so they agreed to meet together the next day. Uh, the next day rolls around, and Appion doesn't show up, but Clement basically just tells a story about a um, incident in which he had played a trick on Apion, and um, they end up going and finding Apion. He he promised to come back the next day, and so so they could continue the debate. So now we're at the next. Uh, this will be the third day when uh, I suppose Apion is actually going to show up now. So, <clears throat> and on the third day, when I came with my friends to the appointed place in Tyre, I found Apion sitting between a Nubian and. Athenodorus, and waiting for us, along with many other learned men. But in no wise dismayed, I greeted them, and sat down opposite from Apion, and in a little he began to speak. I wish to start from the beginning point, and to come with all speed at once to the question before you, my son Clement. Or, I'm sorry. Before you, my son Clement, joined us, my friend Anubian here, and Athenodorus, who uh, yesterday where among those who heard you discourse were reporting to me what you said of the numerous false accusations I brought against the gods when I was visiting you in Rome. At the time, you were shaming love, how I cha uh, charged them with uh, pederasty, <laughs> I guess how you say it, um, lasciviousness, numerous incests of all kinds, but my son Clement but my son, you ought to have known that I was not in earnest when I wrote such things about the gods. But was concealing the truth for my love to you. That truth, however, if it so please you, you may hear from me now. So, uh, you know, now Appion is saying that the things he wrote in his letter he didn't actually mean. Um, <clears throat> he goes on to say, the wisest of the ancients, men who had by hard labor learned all truth, kept the path of knowledge hid from those who were unworthy and had no taste for lessons in divine things. For it is not really true that from Oranus and his mother Gay were twelve sons, were born twelve children, as the myth counts them. Six sons, Okeanos, Coeus, Creos, Hyperion, uh, Japhoth, Kronos and six daughters, Thea, Themis, Menesaeus, Menesene, Demeter, uh, Thethis, and Rhea. Nor that Kronos was the knife of Adam it mutilated, uh, not that Kronos, but the knife, knife of Adamant mutilated his father Oranos, as you say, and threw the part into the sea, nor that Aphrodite sprang from the drops of blood which flowed from it, nor that Kronos associated with Rhea and devoured his first son, his first begotten son Pluto, because a certain saying of Prometheus led him to fear that a child born from him would wax stronger than himself and spoil him of his kingdom, nor that he devoured on the same way Poseidon, his second child, nor that when Zeus was born next, his mother Rhea concealed him, and when Kronos asked for him that he might devour him, gave him a stone and said, instead, nor that this, when it was devoured, pressed those that had been previous devoured and forced them out, so that Pluto, who was devoured first, came out first, and after him Poseidon, and then Zeus, nor that Zeus, as the story goes, preserved by the wit of his mother, ascended into heaven. and spoiled his father of the kingdom, nor that he punished his father's brothers, nor that he came down to lust after mortal women, nor that he associated with his sisters and daughters and sister-in-law and was guilty of shameful uh, 
Podastri, nor that he devoured his daughter Matis, in order that he might that from her he might make uh, Athena be born out of his own brain, and from his thigh might bear Dionysus, who is said to have been rent in pieces by the Titans, nor that he held a feast at marriage. The, At the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, nor that he excluded uh, Eris uh, from the marriage, nor that Eris, on her part, thus dishonored, contrived an occasion of quarreling and discord among the feasters, nor that she took a golden apple from the gardens of uh, Hesperides and wrote on it for the fair, and then they, fa they fable how Hera and Athena and Aphrodite found the apple and quarreling about it came to Zeus and he did not decide it for them but sent them to Hermes to the shepherd um, Paris to be judged of their beauty. But there was no such judging of the goddesses nor did Paris give the apple to Aphrodite nor did Aphrodite being thus honored honored him in return by giving Helen to wife for the honor bestowed by the goddess could not have been furnished by uh, could never have furnished a pretext for a universal war, and that to the ruin of him who was honored himself nearly related to the race of Aphrodite. But my son, as I have said, such stories have a peculiar and philosophical meaning, which can be allegory set forth in a way which, that you yourself would listen with wonder. And I said, I beseech you not to torment me with delay. And he said, Do not be afraid. For I shall lose no time, but commence at once. So basically, uh, Apion is saying that these myths of the gods are not myths at all, but they're just allegories. And so all these events that are told about in these, these myths, which seem to paint their, their pagan gods in a negative light, is not really what happened. Um, and so he's about to reveal the truth, this secret hidden uh, knowledge that is concealed in these stories of uh, the, the pagan Greco-Roman gods. Okay, it says, There was once a time when nothing existed but chaos and a confused mixture of orderless elements, which were, not, which were as yet simple heaped together. This nature testifies, and great men have been of opinion that it was so. Of these great men I shall bring forward to you him who uh, excelled them all in wisdom, Homer, where he says, with a reference to the original confused mass, but may you all become water and earth. Implying that from these things, from these all things have their origin, and that all things return to their first state, which is chaos, when the watery and earthly substances are separated, and Hesiod in the Theogony says, assuredly, chaos was the very first to come into being. Uh, now, by come into being, he evidently means that chaos came into being as having a beginning and didn't always, always exist without beginning. And Orpheus likes chaos to an egg in which uh, was confused mixture of the primordial elements. <clears throat> then chaos, which... Orpheus calls an egg is taken for granted by Hesiod, uh, having a beginning produced from infinite matter and originated in the following way. This matter of four kinds and endowed with life was an entire uh, infinite abyss, so to speak, an eternal stream, born about without order and forming every now and then countless but ineffectual combinations. For therefore it is dissolved again from one of order, ripe indeed but not able to be bound so as to generate a living creature. And once it chanced that this infinite sea, which was thus by its own nature driven about with the natural motion, flowed in an orderly manner from the same to the same, back on itself, like a whirlpool, mixing the substances in such a way that from each there flowed down the middle of the universe as in a funnel of a mold, uh, precisely that which was the most useful and suitable for the generation of a living creature. This was carried down by the all-carrying whirlpool um, that drew to itself the surrounding spirit and having been so conceived that it was very fertile, 
formed a separate substance. For just as a bubble is usually formed in water, so everything round about contributed to the conception of this ball-like globe. Then there came forth the, to the light, after it being conceived in itself, and was born upwards by the divine spirit which surrounded it. Perhaps the greatest thing ever born, a piece of workmanship, so to speak, having life in it, which has been conceived from the entire infinite abyss, in shape like an egg, and as swift as a bird. Okay, so you may be thinking like, all right, why are they talking about all this things about the Greco-Roman gods and, and why, is, why are they going into all this mythology and crap? <clears throat> and I'm wondering if there's a point to it. I, like I've said, this is the first time I've actually read the homilies, the whole thing. Now, I do want to bring up something. I think it's a good time to bring it up, um, take a break from all this pagan junk. Uh, what we are reading is the Greco-Roman um, recognitions and homilies. Now, if you go to Amazon, see here's Amazon. I know you can't see the whole thing, the whole screen, but you go to Amazon and the, you can actually get a copy of the Clementine recognitions and homilies. In Syriac. Now, Syriac itself is a Semitic language, it's, uh, similar to like Hebrew or Aramaic, um, and so it's a different. This is the first time it's been translated into English. You can see here it was. This copy was released in 2014. Uh, there is other copies, or other uh, one other version. This one down here, the red one, but you can see it's seventy-two dollars. Uh, the other one is nineteen ninety nine. Much rather spend uh, twenty bucks instead of seventy two. But if you go to the table of contents here, you'll notice that this book now is based upon a Syriac manuscript that dates back to the uh, I think the year four sixteen. Now, the way that that copy's put together. It's book one of the recognitions, book two of the recognitions, book three of the recognitions, and then four. So the first four chapter or the first four books in the Syriac Clementine literature is comes from the first four books of the recognitions. Then it switches over into book ten of the homilies. And the rest of it is books ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen in the homilies. Um, some have theorized that, that this is the actual original order of the Clementine writings. And so um, what we're reading right now, we're in uh, homily number six. So notice that the, the real Greco-Roman kind of debate about these, these pantheon of gods began in, I believe, I believe it started in uh, homily number five. So, or no, four. I think it started in number four. Um, so notice that five, six, seven, eight, and nine are not even included here. So I'm guessing that, that what we're reading right now was an addition from something. Like this all got added at some point. That's my guess. I don't know. But uh, but I'm going to go ahead and read the whole thing um, just so that we can, you know, thoroughly study the thing out. Um, and then, but remember, homily number 10 is the one where it really switches back to what we have in the, uh, in the Syriac. So especially if you're a Hebrew roots person who's kind of centered more on, the, you know, the Hebraic, mindset, the Hebraic type of uh, writings, the Syriac would be more like what's right up your alley, I think, more so than this, because this is, this what we're reading, it was translated from Syriac or Aramaic, I believe Aramaic is what the claim was, translated from Aramaic into Latin, into Greek, and then into English. So it's been translated through several different languages, and 
when it moved through the Latin and the Greek, that's where it may have picked up uh, these extra. So you know, if you if you're listening to uh, to these presentations and you enjoy the Clementine writings, I would highly recommend getting a copy of the Syriac. You know, you can get free downloads of uh, the homilies and the recognitions, uh, like like the ones we're reading here, that's translated from the, the Greek and Latin. But the Syriac is slightly different. Um, and honestly, the most memorable, the best parts from the homilies and recognitions are the parts that's in, that's in the Syriac. Um, The things that are different are the things that are generally thought of to be about Paul. Um, and so, I, you know, I've had people say that, well, you know, the things that you say about Paul in these recordings make me really uncomfortable. I don't like the way that you make Paul out to be this guy, bad guy or whatever. Um, believe it or not, the the... The Syriac is a lot more revealing about it. Um, and if the Syriac is the original, it's a lot more definitive that, that things were not as they seem with Paul. Because, you know, Paul had this conversion on the, on the road to Damascus. And uh, whenever he went to Damascus to um, persecute the assembly and according to the Syriac version of the recognitions after Paul went to Damascus he ends up finding the uh, the uh, apostles and their followers in Jericho and he ends up killing two of them two of their two of their disciples so now wait a minute isn't that supposed to be after after Paul's conversion, you know, it said that that was a couple of months after Paul's conversion that he that he killed those two men. Um, well, it doesn't say Paul personally killed them. It said that Paul showed up there, raised a tumult against them, and the result involved two people being killed, uh, two of the followers of Yeshua being killed. So, uh, anyway, but, you know, but a lot of the other stuff is in there, the discussions with James and uh, such and so forth, and I, I really enjoy it. Unfortunately, I don't have it on the computer. All I got is the, the book version of it, you know, I don't have a PDF or whatever like I do with these, and that's why I'm going through this one instead of the, uh, the Syriac versions, because I don't have a PDF of, of the Syriac. Anyway. All right, back to the back to the to the text. It says, "Now you must think that Chronos is time, and Rhea as the flowing of the watery substance. For the whole body of matter was born about for some time before it brought forth, like an egg, the the sphere-like, all-embracing heaven, which at first was full of productive marrow." so that it were able to produce out of itself elements and colors of all sorts, which from the one substance and the one color it produces all kind of forms, for as a peacock's egg seems to, only, seems to have only one color, while potentially it has in it all the colors of the animal that is to be, so that this living egg conceived out of the infinite matter, which set, up, which set in motion by the underlying and ever-flowing matter, produces many forms, many different forms. For within the circumference of a certain living creature, uh, which is both male and female, is formed by the skill of the indwelling divine spirit, the Orpheus called Phanes, because when it appeared uh, as the universe, the universe shone forth from it with the luster of that most glorious of the elements, fire, perfected in moisture, now is this incredible sense in glowworms, nature gives us to see a moist light. You know, when I read this, the thing that kind of stands out to me, he's talking about like this primordial 
mixture of elements. It sounds like that primordial soup that the evolutionists say everything springs forth. And uh, reading this and and thinking about <clears throat> okay, what did the what did the pagans believe about the creation? You know, it's actually very similar to what evolutionists believe. Um, you know, you don't generally think of evolution as being pagan or having pagan roots, but um, I wonder if um, if there is something about the origin of evolution coming out of this uh, pagan uh, Grecian belief or whatever. <clears throat> anyway, it says, This egg, then, which was the first substance growing somewhat hot, was broken by the living creature within, and <clears throat> then there took shape and came forth something such as Orpheus also speaks of, where he says, when the uh, capacious egg was broken, etc. And so by the mighty power of that which appeared and came forth, the globe uh, attained coherency and maintained order, while it itself took its seat, as it were, on the summit of heaven. There an ineffable mystery diffusing light through endless ages, but the productive matter left inside the globe separated the substance of all things. For first, its lower part, just like the dreg, sank downward of its own weight, and this they call Pluto from the gravity, and weight in great quantity of underlying matter, styling it the king of Hades and the dead. When then they saw this primordial substance, although most filthy and rogue, was devoured by Kronos, that is, time, this is to be understood in a physical sense as meaning that it sank downwards, and the water which flowed together after the first sediment and floated on the surface of the first substance they called Poseidon, and then what remained the purest and noblest of all was the tra translucent fire they called Zeus, from its glowing uh, nature, now since fire ascends, this was not swallowed and made to descend by time or chronos, but as I said, the fiery substance, since it has life in it and naturally ascends, flew right up in the air from which it, from which its purity is very intelligent. Okay, again, this to me sounds very much like evolution. You know, it's talking about this uh, primordial substance, and you give it enough... Uh, enough chronos, enough time, and add a little fire, you know, or whatever, and out of all this uh, comes life. <laughs> uh, but his own proper heat then, Zeus, that is, uh, the glowing substance, draws up what is left in the underlying moisture to wit that is very strong and divine spirit, which they call Methus. So basically it's like evolution it's just the evolution took out this divine spirit and when forth everything came out of it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just amusing. And this, when it reached the summit of the uh, aether, was devoured by it, moisture being mixed with heat, so to say, and causing in it this uh, ceaseless palpitation, it, be it begat intelligence, which they call palace, from the palipitating, and this... And this is artistic wisdom by which the atheal artif artificer wrought out the whole world. And from all pervading Zeus, that is, from the very hot ether, extends all the way to our earth, and this they called Hera. Wherefore, because it has come below the aether, the ether, which is the purest substance, just as a woman as regards purity is inferior, when the two were compared to see which was better, she was rightly regarded as the sister of Zeus in respect of her origin from the same substance, but as his spouse as being inferior like a wife. And Hera we understood to be a happy tempering of the atmosphere, and therefore she is very fruitful, but Athena, as they say, as they call Pallas, was reckoned a virgin because on account of the intense heat she could produce nothing. And in, the, and in a similar fashion, Artemis is explained. For her, 
they take as the lowest depths of air, and so they call her a virgin because she could not bear anything on account of the extreme cold. And they troubled and drunken, and that troubled and drunken composition which arises from the upper and lower vapors, they call uh, Dionysus as troubling the intellect, and the water under the earth, which in, is in nature indeed one, but which flows through all the path of the earth and is divided into many other parts, they call a, a cirrus being cut in pieces, and they understand Artemis as favorable seasons, Aphrodite as coalition and generation, Demeter as the earth, the girl Persephone as seeds, and Dionysus, uh, some understand, as the vine. Uh, says, I must think you to, I must ask you to think of all such stories as embodying some such allegory. Look on Apollo as a wandering son, the son of Zeus, who is also called Mithras. Um, okay, so if we talk about <clears throat> in the Hebraic roots, a system of belief, we understand that a lot of the Christian doctrines comes from a mixture of uh, Messianic Hebrew thought and Mithraism. So who is Mithra? Uh, Apollo, the wandering son, a son of Zeus who's also called Mithra. So Mithra and Apollo are the same, apparently. Seems like I've heard that before also, but just... Uh, that would be... That's maybe an interesting thing to kind of put back in your memory bank if anyone starts bringing up Mithra at some point, you could look to Apollo and really uh, maybe see some more connections with this kind of junk. Okay. So who is also called Mithras as completing the period of a year. And this would have been like the, 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 the homilies and Clementine writings, they were written at about the time when Mithraism was popular. So it would have been in that, in that age when the author should know. Uh, again, I have doubts that Clement actually wrote this particular part of the Clementine writings, but regardless of who the author was, it would have been around the time when Mithraism was popular. Um, and these said transformations of the all-pervading Zeus must be regarded uh, as the numerous changes in the seasons, while his numberless wives, you must understand to be years or generations, for the power which proceeds from the ether and passes through the air unites with all the years and generations in turn and continually varies them and so producing or produces or destroys the crops and, and ripe fruits are called his children, the barrenness of some uh, seasons being referred to as unlawful unions. While Apion was allegorizing in this way, I became plunged in thought and seemed not to be following what he was saying, so he interrupted his discourse and said to me, If you do not follow what I am saying, why should I speak at all? And I answered, Do not suppose that I do not understand what you say. I understand it thoroughly, and uh, that the more that this is not the first time I have heard it, uh, and that you might know that I am not ignorant of these things, I shall epitomize what you have said and shall supply in their order, as I've heard them from others, the allegorical interpretations of these stories you have omitted, and Appian said, do so. And I answered, I shall not at present speak particularly of the living egg, which was conceived by a happy combination out of infinite matter, and from which, when it was broken, the masculo-feminine feinies leapt for let forth, as some say. I say little about that, about all that up to the point where this broken globe attained uh, coherency. There being left in it some of its narrow like matter, and I shall briefly run over the description of what took place in it by the agency of this matter with all that followed. For from Kronos and Rhea were born, as you say, that is, by time and matter, first Pluto, who represents the sediment which settled down, and then Poseidon, the liquid substance in the middle, which floated to the heavier, over the heavier body below, and the third child, that is Zeus, is the ether and is highest of all. It is not devoured, but it is fiery power, and naturally ascends. It flew up as with a bound to the very highest aether. And the bonds of Kronos 
are the binding together of heaven and earth, and as I have heard others allegorizing, and his mutilation is the separation of parting of the elements, for they all were severed and separated according to the respective natures, that each might, um, that each kind might be arranged in itself, and time no longer begets anything, but all things which have been begotten of it, by a law of nature producing their successors, and the Aphrodite, who emerged from the sea, is fruitful substance, which arises out of moisture, which, with which warm the spirit mixing causes that sexual desire and perfects the beauty of the world. And this marriage banquet at which Zeus held a feast on occasion of the marriage of his Nereid, uh, Thetis, and the beautiful uh, Peleus has in it, in it this allegory that you may know, Apion, that you are not the only one from whom I have heard this sort of thing. The banquet then is the world, and the twelve are the heavenly props of the fates, called the zodiac. Prometheus is foresight, um, by which all things arose. Pelus is clay, namely that which is collected from the earth and mixed with uh, nereis, or water, to produce man. And from the mixing of the two, i.e. water and earth, the first offspring was not begotten, but fashioned complete and called Achilles, because he never put his lips to the breast. Still in the blood of life, he is slain by an arrow while desiring to, ha to have polyxena, that is, something other than the truth, and foreign zany to it, death stealing on him through a wound in his foot. Then Hera and Athena and Aphrodite and uh, Eris and the apple and Hermes and the judgment and the shepherd have uh, some such hidden meaning as the following. Hera is a, is a dignity. Um, Athena, manliness. Aphrodite, pleasure. Hermes, language, which interprets uh, thought. The shepherd, Paris, unreasoned and brutish passion. Now, if in the prime of life, reason that shepherd of the soul is brutish does not regard his own advantage, will have nothing to do with manliness and temperance chose only pleasure, and gives the prize to lust alone, bargaining that it is to receive uh, in return from lust what may delight it. He who thus judges incorrectly will choose pleasure to his own destruction and that of his friends, and Eris is jealous spite, and the golden apple of the uh, Hesperidae, or Hesperids, Hesperides, I guess, I don't know, are perhaps riches by which occasionally even temperate persons like Hera are seduced, and manly ones like Athena are made jealous, so that um, they do not, so that they do things which do not become them. And the soul's beauty, like Aphrodite, is destroyed under the guise of refreshment. To speak briefly, in all men, riches provoke evil discord. Okay, uh, we're at thirty-three minutes. It's a good time to stop. Uh, I think this we're more than halfway through this homily, so we'll. Go ahead and end it here. We'll come back and finish this homily up in the next video. Shalom and thanks for listening.